This program is brought to you in part by City Winery. So welcome back for a new episode of uh, Books du Jour. We've taken a little hiatus, but now we're back with a brand new panel and obviously very interesting books. Three great guests and three great books. Um, I'm going to start with George Proshnik, The Impossible Exile. Stephen Zweig, The End uh, of the World. The story of uh, someone living outside his own country. You know, and I think it's about the theme of this panel today, uh, how to travel. Weapons of Mass Diplomacy by Antonin Baudry, AKA Abel Lanzac. You have to explain to us why you came up with this nom de plume and the reprints of life, which we all could do with, right? But boys, fishermen. <laughs> uh, let me start with uh, George, since you were the first book. Um, you, very few people know who uh, Stephen Zweig is, and uh, it seems probably in America. What do you ascribe that to? Here, there was such a sense, A, of repudiation of the old Europe, which he'd represented, mm -hmm. um, that I think that there was a period initially at least, where he managed to be kind of repellent, actually, to American audiences, partly also because of his suicide, it, because he was seen by many of the refugees in the United States, some of whom were involved with publishing, as betraying the values of, of the Europe that they tried to represent mm -hmm. even outside Europe in, in well, their state of exile. We've had a lot of Russian society uh, authors and they're still being okay you know, with their posterity. How, did, how was his background and how did he start writing? He was born into a very affluent family. His father had uh, textile factories. In Vienna. In right? Vienna, yeah. correct. And he, from an early age, was at really the center of Viennese literary life within what I would call sort of the popular, not the super elite, and this is critical. Zweig is, Zweig is much more accessible than, than uh, say, Hermann Brock or Musil or some of these other Central European figures, and this is one reason that Zweig was, in fact, so immensely popular. But he ultimately attributed his success to what he described as a radical character flaw, which was extreme impatience, mm -hmm. that he, he, he got bored. And he describes wanting, in fact, to propose to publishers an edition of all the great works of literature with all the slow parts crossed out. And you know, he described Thomas Mann, you know, going back to all the great Victorian novelists and having no, having no hesitation to uh, diminishing the size of a work to increase its narrative drive. Mm -hmm. What were the values that he was repudiating in people's eyes? For a long time, I mean, Zweig had been criticized very intensely for having failed to speak out more stridently against the Nazis. Uh, a number of Jewish organizations and Jewish uh, writers had, had denounced what they saw as something virgin, verging on collaboration, particularly because he actually did collaborate with the man who became the head, really, of the Reichs, the Third Reich's musical establishment, Richard Strauss. And, but yeah. Zweig saw this as, in fact, a form of, of defiance, that he he felt that to show that Jews were capable of, of working with the anointed great artists of the Nazi regime mm -hmm. proved that they could not be the subhuman slime that Goebbels had. Well, it's interesting. Do. The theme of itself, the wandering Jew, he became almost that person who could not find connection. Why was that so important for you to, to tackle? Well, I mean, th there was first in his own in his own case, an incredible irony that he had written a sort of valedictory hymn about exile in one of his books, his biography of, of Napoleon's chief of police, mm -hmm. Joseph Fouché. He'd actually said that all the great works of humanity were written in exile, and he himself had been such a voluntary nomad throughout his life. He'd loved travel, he'd loved that sense of constant mobility, that it was extraordinary that what he had seen as the great liberation of not being overly tied to one piece of soil became his ultimately uh, fatal curse. And for myself, I mean, I, 
I was so conscious that there's a certain trajectory of, and I'm interested what you have to say about yeah. this, but a certain, a certain trajectory of escape from, um, from a state that becomes oppressive or murderous, which I think cuts across many different ethnic backgrounds and, mm -hmm. and, and global conflicts, where we sort of, we have this story that for the people who made it out, there were, there were harrowing moments at home, and then somehow or other they get it together, and they manage to make this grand crossing, and then it's tough, but life sort of come back, comes back together. That was certainly the narrative in my own mm -hmm. home. My, my grandparents escaped at the last moment. They were on a list to be picked up in 24 hours by the Gestapo, found out about it by chance, and managed to go into hiding overnight, and eventually, through a very circumlocutious peregrination to get to get to the United States. Zweig's story, because he was free of all the material constraints that so many refugees suffered under, allowed me to really look at how, how an exile could go so wrong, even when you did still have work and friends and connections and were theoretically able to recreate a life almost anywhere. You were talking very much about uh, uprooted people that came to the state also, not to, I mean, started with the Holocaust and then and the, the opening of the, the Russian borders. What was your experience like for you, if you had any memory? To, to leave the Soviet Union? Yeah. Well, what I thought of immediately was, um, um, <clears throat> I'm now the age that my father was when we left the Soviet Union. Right. And so I'm thinking a lot this year about what if I picked up, and I guess I would have to go to like North Korea at this point <laughs> in order to experience something as foreign. Yeah. I mean, imagine a country um, that uh, you never you, you never have firsthand access to. Nobody gets to go to America except diplomats. It's, you know, the Iron Curtain is for real. You can't even get out to Bulgaria, let alone America. Um, and the only things that you know about it are the bad things. On the television, you see only poor people. Skid Row in LA or what have you. That's, that's the, um, by the way, Zweig was one of the very few Western authors published in the Soviet Union because he was deemed progressive and humanist. I know that when he went yeah. there to lecture, he was, he was met with enormous acclaim filled huge halls and right. other places. You knew of Troy before the book came out? Yes, okay. yes, absolutely, because uh, I did some academic work. Um, when the Soviet Union had a brief thaw in the 50s, mm -hmm. I looked at uh, the literature that was published in the country and what changed. And all of a sudden, people like Troy published a lot more. Interesting. Um, but anyway, um, there's a way in which my parents, who are now 25 years older than they were when they came here, they are far less fluent in this culture than I am. They don't have the English as easily. Look, I just misspoke myself. They don't have English as well as well as I do. Yeah, I'm regressing. That's all right. It happens to everyone. We're gonna move this around. Um, and yet, they feel at home here in a weird way, um, much more than I do. I live in New York City for reasons that I don't have to explain. It's 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 foreign feeling in a way that makes me feel at home. They live in suburban New Jersey where no surprising things happen, and a true law and order regime reigns. Um, my father seems to appreciate greatly um, sort of the sense of authority that constantly, you know, it's like... Probably ingrained in his cell. Yeah, 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 because things were so, the law was so arbitrarily observed in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, you just, especially if you're Jewish, your, your position was so tenuous, so precarious, that you really didn't know how things would turn out. So he loves living in a town where you know, the police chase after you after a speeding infraction, like Navy SEALs tackling a terrorist, you know, like they're just, <laughs> he feels so safe to live in town where like recycling regulations are so specific that he knows exactly what thing he needs to put out on what day. He just, he savors that, you know? In that sense, I feel like he's far more American than, than I am, or far more appreciative of a certain kind of lifestyle here than I will ever be. I would die if I lived in that town. <laughs> Your own book has turned, uh, got uh, turned into a film? Yeah. Like, have, have you seen it? Have you seen it? It's called pri The Prime Minister, is that what you said? The Minister. The Minister. Yeah. Where I, you, I, uh, I, did you have a good reaction? I saw it, yeah, and I, I wrote it actually with the. the oh, you did, did the script? Yeah. Okay. And, but just a word about Zweig, because Zweig is a real literary hero in France, mm. and I think in, in a vast part of Europe. And maybe because we, we feel differently about history and the, the war, because these two world wars are really felt as mm -hmm. suicide for Europe. So Zweig so kind of incarnates in a very humanist way this kind of 
suicide. He also explicitly wrote about that idea of Europe committing suicide over and over in the last years, yeah. and he was an enormous Francophile. And, and really, in, in you sense reading his memoir that it was only when he went to Paris for the first time that he really understood what tolerance meant. And he, he, he describes in these rhapsodic terms what it was like to see mixed race couples dashing up inside apartment mm -hmm. buildings. He, he describes going into one very fancy restaurant and a, and a family of, of Norman farmers <coughs> coming into this restaurant and receiving no askance looks from the wait staff as they certainly would have, as he notes, in Berlin or in Vienna or in London. And, and, I, and he was so enamored of those values, the, sort of the best mm -hmm. values of the French Revolution, that he continued to to the end, to sort of valorize those as yeah. the you know the the, the pan-European sense of the rights of live and let live. These ideas were really what he fought for as hard as he did for any kind of specifically literary. It's true. Value. And he, he wrote the best biography of a very important character in France, who is Fouché, who was yeah, the minister of police. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and, and I mean, in this book, he kind of understands all the Machiavelli-like mm -hmm. attitude of these politicians. And I think he, he takes it from a distance too. So I think he's he's really American in this sense too. Uh -huh. So I was, yeah, because he he understands, but he doesn't approve mm -hmm. the way Fouché acts. And you know, it's interesting that you bring up that book because that was that was one where he tried desperately to persuade his publisher to to run a print run of many fewer books than he wanted to. He said, there's no love story. Fouché is a very unpleasant character. This isn't going to sell yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it immediately yeah. it proved very popular. It's so interesting that he seems to have been very sensitive to the market and how the market Super functions. Super sensitive. Yeah. 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 He, there are these beautiful books that he kept that I've seen with enormous books, I mean, they're ledger books, with records of each translation and sort of charting the progress of sales and the trans position into film and into other media, into radio plays, et cetera. Antonin, you work with a lot with the politicians. You talk about Fouché there. Um, your experience, uh, did that turn you into a cynical being <laughs> or not? Not exactly. On the no. contrary, I think that these guys have a sacrificial life somehow. They sacrifice everything, their family, their friends, their family, everything. Because if they want really to do something, they have to fight for it like during 60 mm -hmm. years and do only that. I think they're crazy. I think you have to be crazy to be a politician okay. at a high level. I think you succeeded in the character of Alexander. I mean, uh, he seems like oh, so overpowering in his, with his philosophy. He just feel like, is he serious or not? Uh, but I think that this, yeah, but I think that this craziness is somehow not only useful but necessary yeah. in a way. Wait, what or kind of craziness is it? I mean, what what I mean when you say you know that there's a form of insanity. I mean, what. What do you see that... You have to surrender right. a sense of privacy a bit, or maybe it's different in France, but yeah. here you do. <laughs> uh, they're really ego-driven, obviously, so that makes them really vulnerable somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that makes them have... They have to find a kind of source of inspiration and strength or moral, uh, uh, moral strength. drive or strength that, that, that is bizarre from mm -hmm. the outside. And the character I tried to depict in, in, in Weapons of Mass Diplomacy is kind of inhabited by a, another soul. He's like, he's like a shaman. Somehow it's necessary to, because if he had been a kind of regular politician, France would have gone to the, to the war to Iraq, which from my point of view would have been a bad decision. Mm -hmm. It really took a crazy guy to say no to the US mm -hmm. by this time, because contrary to what many people think, at this time in France, it's true that the, I mean, a, a, a lot of people were against the war in the streets, mm -hmm. but the elite, the groups close to the power, they were all in favor of the war, Ooh. especially because they, 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 they really they had a lot of fear from the reaction of the US, for the markets they would lose, for uh, everything. Think, yeah. So there was a lot of pressure. There were experts coming every day. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it takes a kind of craziness to, to, to hold the line somehow. Mm -hmm. And that's why I tried to, to show in the book because the process is really chaotic and it's mm -hmm. like he forges his opinions through speeches that he writes yeah. or that he makes his speechwriter write for him, but he, he changes his mind and comes back and forth. But it's a kind of tribute to the f another German person, not uh, the, the yeah. philosopher uh, uh, George Friedrich Hegel. Mm -hmm. It's the way a, a very messy and chaotic process can uh, drive you to a very rational decision somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talking about philosophy, there's a quote from uh, Heraclitus, 
in uh, at, at the beginning or even the main character whose idea was that I mean what was that important to disseminate a message I'm obsessed by Heraclitus and Democritus I must okay. say it's two philosophers that have opposite attitudes one loves all the time Democritus mm -hmm. and Heraclitus uh, cries all the time it's so the so two attitudes they have the towards the world yeah. they, wor they look at the world and they laugh and cry and I thought when I was there at the ministry I, I didn't understand at all what was happening I had no training I was I had just done a math before and and some studies in literature and I hadn't worked before so I was the speechwriter I, I thought it would be easy because the guys would tell me what I was supposed to write but it was the contrary nobody knew so mm -hmm. I had to and and so and and so I, I kind of had the choice between laughing and crying so and and as the minister was always quoting a lot of authors that nobody knew and all of that so I, I chose I chose Heraclitus and Democritus to kind of... Oh, so in the real life he was doing that? He was doing that, not with Heraclitus no, and Democritus. Okay, he didn't know them, yeah. but, but, but with Rambo and mm. this kind of... You know, it's very interesting because there are people <laughs> that create history, yeah, and yet when you, it feels like they only go forwards for the last minute news and then try to fix that and then you never look back. You know, I, I, I thought that dichotomy was very interesting. Did you, you have a sense of that when you were yeah, working? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I, I would say that 90% of the politicians in France act this way. This one didn't act this way. But because he was crazy, so it was another <laughs> problem that made All that right. he didn't have this problem. But at least he didn't have this problem. Talk, were you talking about a wild story? Your story is pretty wild as well. The story yeah. is about a young man who forges Holocaust restitution claims yeah. for old Russian Jews in mm -hmm. South Brooklyn. It starts with um, his grandmother, <coughs> who is the only legal Holocaust survivor in the family, passing away. The husband who survives her, his grandfather, says, why don't you write it about me instead? And the grandson, who's trying to become, trying to become an American, which in his reductive sense means uh, enough mm -hmm. of this immigrant scraping and hustling and cheating, right, yeah. let's be moral, this is why we came here, you can afford to be decent here. He says, absolutely not. Um, you weren't, you didn't, you, 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 you know, it says for people who suffered and you didn't suffer. And the grandfather says, I didn't suffer? I may not have suffered in the exact way I need yeah. to have suffered in order to qualify for these uh, restitutions <coughs> that are, by the way, arrived at by human beings and sure. not God. But suffer I did, and let me tell you how. And so mm. sort of this debate begins between them, and eventually the grandson caves, and not for the most savory reasons either. Partly he wants to, he does become convinced by his grandfather's logic, but also he's got a huge ego and he wants to be a writer and he's being ignored at the magazine where he works in Manhattan. And so this is an opportunity to be a lionized writer in a kind of humble arena, but nonetheless. Yeah. And also it becomes a chance to recreate his grandmother on the page because he never really got to know her in real life. So all these things kind of collide and motivate him to different degrees at different times. At one moment, he's focusing on one motivation. At another moment, he's focusing on another. But in my life, I felt that it's never a neat story where you're always cleanly motivated by a single thing. It's sure. always different things calibrated differently at different times. Some good, some not so good, and sort of you have to navigate that as morally as you can, and that's what he tries to mm -hmm. do in the novel. So the process of writing, I mean, you and I talked a little bit before the panel, like, you know, I felt the tone uh, of your writing around the other author, but it's a feel like I'm punchy. You feel like it's a, sort of an underlying anger. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of anger because, because um, you know, the really simplistic narrative of the American dream is, speaking to exile, it was bad back there, but now you're going to come here, it's going to be great. You're going yeah, to be free, you're going you're to make money, you're gonna, it just, it's just going to be great. And it's nothing like that. Uh, the American dream is not panning out for Slava. He has no idea how to become a fully-fledged American while honoring these elders whose definition of honor is derived from the old country. Mm -hmm. He has no idea how to build these bridges. He it's, it's all kind of variations on despair. <laughs> yeah, you think the language stems from what? From the inability to be one-sided? Yeah, I mean... Uh, do you think it'd be clear if you're just American, do you think? Or you think so so Slava, Slava, the narrator, his utterly fantastical wish at the outset of the novel is, okay, which am I? Am I Russian or am I... As if it's possible mm -hmm. to be one or the other. Only one person in my family has read the novel, uh, my mother. And she finished it very late one night. She sent me a text message that said, it's the most meaningful thing my mother has ever said to me because it, had, it understood me better than she ever had before. And it okay. said, now I get it. You're 100% 100, 100 American and 100% Russian. That's nice. Okay. It is really, really nice. Yeah. One of the most gratifying things that have happened. Um, uh, but that's what Slava takes a novel. You, can, you, you, you will never be fully both. You will never be fully uh, neither. Um, you just pick and choose. Mm -hmm. And depending on the moment, just like I was saying with motivations, situationally, how American versus Russian you are, how French versus American you are, mm -hmm. shifts. 
you know, and, and that's okay. There's nothing yeah. inauthentic about that. Was there, have you traveled to Russia? Or yeah. Well, East Germany during the day, back in the days, or so. Yeah, I spent time in Russia. Okay. And when was and that recently then? I went yeah. to Berlin and I met a lot of Russians and I was. I must confess that I was liberated when I had this talk with Russian people who saw the world very negatively. Because it, as I live here in the US, it had been months, maybe years, <laughs> since I had heard someone saying, you know, it's a catastrophe, nobody's <laughs> good. I mean, everybody's so positive here, I love it, but everybody's like a superhero mm -hmm. all the time. And I had there people who were like happy, drinking vodka and yeah. enjoying life, and at the same time saying, no, the world is really bad, but let's, let's enjoy. And I, I was happy. Then I was happy to be back here too. <laughs> so yeah, but I, I, yeah. So do you, I mean, you, you've been living abroad for a long time as well. Yeah. Do you feel uh, your French identity is slippering a little bit, or is it because you're so immersed with the French, it's just so as strong as ever? Kind of. I, I feel I feel like a New Yorker here because I think it's very easy to feel like How a, been a here? New Yorker. Four years. Four years. Okay. I'm, uh, I felt as a New Yorker the first minute I arrived because I was I, I, I took a, a, a taxi. Mm. And the taxi arrived the same day as I, and he was on the phone with a, the, the, he was on the phone with a cousin of him, who was in Africa, driving him through the streets mm -hmm. by phone because he was here before and mm -hmm. the guy didn't know. And, and I mean, and, and we were all together in the same mess. I, I was supposed to go somewhere. I didn't know where it was, and I felt like okay, everybody's like me here. Everybody has an accent. Uh, it's okay. But to answer your question, actually, I discovered m I, I, I really discovered my country here. Okay. Because when you live somewhere, you're kind of used to everything that's going on. And when you live in another country that is as consistent and coherent as the US, mm -hmm. you suddenly understand that your model is really different. And you suddenly see the architecture of your model. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, this is better here, we should import that. No, mm -hmm. it's really totally different. Y you're looking from the outside in in a way that you sure. don't in your home country. And that, I think, is an indispensable skill for for, for writing? For writing, absolutely. Observation yeah. from the outside in. Yeah, yeah. be a witness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yesterday was the uh, 50th anniversary of the um, Civil Rights Act passed in, uh, by uh, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, there was an article, I think, in Mon uh, Atlantic Monthly, uh, dealing with the retribution, possible retribution for the Africans. You know, it, your book dealt with that. Familiar is with the concept. Is retribution really helpful, or it is a, a meaning? Is it was a, <coughs> a symbolic meaning? It's such a. It's such a. It's a complex question. But yeah, it's such a complex one that I'm. Something seems so coarse about restituting suffering with money, because yeah. then the notion is well, since it, since something has been done, the slate is wiped clean. It seems kind of unfair to to keep someone on the mm -hmm. hook once they have made a gesture, and yet the gesture is so cold. <laughs> Um, in a way, and yet, what can there be but that gesture? Th there's a debate in the novel between uh, two characters where um, uh, Slava, the young man, he says, um, pay them all, pay even the false ones. Like, it, yeah. it can never be enough. No, yeah. um, and the person he's speaking to, who's German, says, precisely, because there can never be justice, there can only be the law. Mm. Imperfect is as good as it gets here. Um, and because there can only be the law, we must scrupulously observe it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I have as little to do with the sins of my grandfathers as you do with yours. The best answer I have is, uh, it's a terrible answer, but it's the only one there is. Okay. George, you had family in Europe as well? Were yes. there like an approach for some uh, sort of uh, restitution? Yes, I mean, my father receives a very small sum um, to this day from, from the Austrian government. But, does, okay. but, you know, it's neither commensurate in a, in a strictly material sense. I mean, we, I, in fact, was just with him a couple of weeks ago for the first time ever traveling in Austria, and we went in Vienna to the apartment building that he lived mm -hmm. in, and, it, and there, there was no ever any pretense to being able to compensate just economically the losses that the family had suffered, and in terms of emotionally, um, and what, this, what the restitution would have meant. I mean, my father's attitude has certainly been I'll take it, you know. I, I mean, they're, they're not even out of anger, but I'll take what I can get. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's it's an interesting point. I mean, I remember a conversation actually that I had not so long ago with um, a Palestinian academic who's now in Ramallah and speaking about. She was speaking about she had, her family had a great deal of, of property near Yaffa, and she was saying people are always asking me, you know, what would it take 
what do you want from the Israelis? And she said, I'll take what I can get. And there is a, I think for, you know, there, 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 there's always going to be um, a contingent of people who had to flee some terrible catastrophe who look for a bottomless mm -hmm. kind of compensation. But also, many people just want it recognized by some sort of physical, physical marker. Yeah. And, and, if, and, if, and if some degree of resti restitution funds can mm -hmm. help to that, maybe it's worth at least making that much of a gesture. Yeah. Yeah. We won't talk about the French colony in Africa, the deserved restitution, but uh, I think maybe this is a great way to, uh, to wrap. The Impossible Exile, Great Life of uh, Stephen Schweig by George Pochnik. I have Weapons of Mass Diplomacy by Antoine Baudry, aka Abel Lanzac. Where does that come from? Were you, you just made it up? Or? Yeah. Um, Abel is because I'm a fan of Abel Ferrara. Okay. And Lanzac is because maybe I was drunk when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Babel Lanzac can be more interesting. <laughs> Babel Lanzac. And Boris Fishman, Replacement Life. Thank you for being on Book du Jour. And Thank you for uh, having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck with all the videos. Thanks for listening to us. Thank you. This program was brought to you in part by City Winery.